Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts. I am Jeremy, and today's episode will be playing the mission, The Brickyard, in which Coster's Brigade fights a delaying action while the last 11th Corps withdraws to Cemetery Hill. But first, the history. If you don't want to listen to the history, a time will come up to go to the mission. Wait for it. Now! Coster's brigade arrived at 3 p.m. from Emmitsburg, taking up positions on Cemetery Hill. Coster put two regiments on either side of the Baltimore Pike, one spread out in the skirmish chain, another on the high street in line. Schurz, in the meantime, made two or three requests for more men to counter an attack on his right flank, but he was denied by Howard, who expected Slocum's 12th Corps to arrive and relieve them, and was reluctant to spare any troops from the vital strategic ground. Eventually, as the men of Early's division appeared, Howard accepts Schurz's request, releasing Coster's brigade of 1,259 men in four regiments, along with Heckman's battery of four Napoleons. However, by four, Schurz sends up Captain Wrinkler in search of Coster's brigade, who arrived up the hill to see they had not moved. Coster was probably still gathering his troops as the smoke was seen over the roofs of the town. Now they were ordered to move beyond the town to cover the retreat. The brigade moved through the streets of Gettysburg at the double. The route was not specified, but a soldier of the 154th New York, the Hardtack Regiment, said Stratton Street or down the Main Street. A historian from the Hardtack Regiment mentioned it was up Baltimore Street, then Carlisle. Harry Puffins believes this could be Stratton Street. As they went, the town came under artillery fire, probably not aimed at the brigade, rather to keep Schur's troops from regrouping. The Confederates were still on the way, slowed by Devon's cavalry and knots of retreating troops. En route, Coster split off the 73rd Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Legion near a railway station reducing his brigade to only 977 men. However, as Coster's men made it to the edge of town, they were too late. The corps was in disarray, and Schurz, who was trying to rally some of Ames's men, directed Coster's brigade northeast of Gettysburg. Coster's brigade took up a position in the Kuhn Brickyard, in modern-day 221 Stratton Street. The brickyard was surrounded by a post and rail fence, with Siemens run on the east and south, and Stratton Street to the west. Coster put the 134th new... Coster put the 134th New York on the right in the wheat field, the Hartack Regiment in the center, the 27th Pennsylvania on the left, and Heckman's Battery on the left on the Carlisle Road by the college. The position was extremely poor as the flanks were unsupported, leaving them vulnerable to envelopment, made worse by the 134th right extending beyond the run. To their front on the left, there was a rise in the ground 220 yards away blocking their line of sight, forcing the 27th Pennsylvania to fire right obliquely in the engagement. The line of sight was made worse as the fields to the brigade's front were full of right wheat. Finally, the ground sloped down from the Stratton Street. Finally, the ground sloped down from Stratton Street to the run. As a consequence, the right could not see what happened on the left. The commander of the Hartack Regiment hoped that he would be warned by Coster if the rebels approached. However, there was no time to change their position, as no sooner had they arrived had the rebels come over the rise. The men knelt or lie and waited ordered to hold their fire until effective. They opened fire with rifle and canister at around 200 yards. The smoke dissipated as the men took up as best a position as they could along the strong post and rail fence. Then a courier rode up to him on his lathered and blowing mount. He obviously got lost in the smoke looking for his brigade and gave Coster the same orders. General Howard orders you to hold your position at all has. Tell that damn Bible thumping mailer to stop sending couriers as we are going to be in the thick of it soon, with my compliment. And he sent the courier back to Cemetery Hill. The courier looked somewhat hurt as he gave another salute and rode off. Coster gave swift orders to his men, yelling to the closer regiments and sending runners to the men on his flanks. He also sent a runner to call up the Pennsylvania Legion from reserve at the Gettysburg Railway Station, ordering them forward at the double, much to the dismay of the legionnaires. As the legion advanced, they passed a steady stream of fleeing troops, rushing down Stratton Street, passing the sidewalks lined with wounded soldiers, some crawling on their hands and knees, others seeking shelter between buildings and in alleys, others carried by comrades to the rear. 
Unbeknownst to the men in the brickyard, the rebels formed line beyond the rise in the ground and were preparing to make an assault just as the 27th Pennsylvania got into their new position on the left of the 134th New York. Some of the men mumbled prayers while others said nothing, but their imagination tortured them with images of hordes of hairy, cussing, tobacco-chewing men of gray and butternut overwhelming their position with their wicked blades and devilish battle cry. Then the Napoleons of the 1st Ohio Light Battery roared, sliding back on their trails and sending shells screaming over the rise, leaving thin gray trails in the air from their burning fuses. The men looked to the rise and knew that the Rebs were not far away. They rested their rifles on the rails of the fence. Some took out pencils to put some form of identification under their hats. Knowing the hard fight they had ahead, Koster licked his lips nervously and said a few words to rally his men, riding his horse across the rear of their ranks. Then Koster quickly spoiled the heroic air by looking behind him for the Pennsylvania Legion. Then the first butternut-clad regiment advanced over the rise in the ground. However, the rebels appeared to be moving towards Stevens Run, threatening to flank the position, and so the officer of the 134th ordered his men to the right and put some of his companies along the fence parallel to the run. As the men moved, they shot glances toward the advancing rebels, hoping they would not hurl themselves forward, sweeping them away. At the same time, the 27th Pennsylvania barely arrived in the position before they were ordered to move forward to support the 134th's left flank. Then the 134th advanced to the fence and awaited their orders. The men watched as a large rebel regiment to their front, wheeled to face them, and they adjusted their formation to meet them, leveling their rifles, resting them once again on the fence post. Pulling their hammers to full cock, they unleashed a burst of gunfire, blanketing their ranks in smoke. The rebels returned their fire with interest, and balls hummed angrily overhead. Suddenly, another rebel regiment supporting the attack of the right flank moved towards Stevens Run. However, in the rush to attack the brickyard, half of their companies rushed in front of the other regiment. In the rear, the Pennsylvania Legion finally arrived, entering the brickyard through a carriage gate, and were ordered to support the 134th and the 27th, moving into their rear by the brickworks. As they moved, the 27th Pennsylvania arrived on the left flank of the 134th and awaited orders to fire. In the meantime, the officers of the 134th encouraged his men, Pour it on them, boys! Pour it into them! As half the rebel regiment entered the shelter of the banks of Stevens Run, while the other companies were slowed, vaulting over the fence while bull and bullet hummed around them. The Pennsylvania Legion was ordered to support the right flank of the 134th as the rightmost companies of the rebel regiment ascended the other bank of the run. The companies of the 134th along the fence opened fire, peppering them with lead. Most of the balls flew high, however, striking only two Johnnies who collapsed and screaming into the run with a splash. On the other side of the brickyard, the commander of the 27th Pennsylvania turned to his left as shouts of alarm from his left flank company to see a regiment of rack ray rebels threatening his flank. He ordered the regiment to wheel right along the fence to face the new threat. The officer of the 27th sent a runner to the Hartack regiment to request their support on his left flank. In the meantime, the combined fire of the companies of the 134th and the Pennsylvania Legion devastated the rebels caught in the open ground. Some of the companies of the Pennsylvania Legion, eager to press their advantage and drive away the flanking rebel regiment, advanced, causing the regiment to become disorganized. So their officer dressed his companies and ordered the regiment to advance to cover the flank of the 134th New York as their rightmost companies were exposed. Coster moved to the center of the three regiments, holding the rack ray hordes at bay with his uniform stained in powder smoke. As he shouted more encouraging words to his men as bullets scythe passed his head, he looked to the right where the rebel flanking force in the open ground took heavy rifle fire from the Pennsylvania Legion and the, and the flank companies of the 134th New York. The hail of lead ripped the butternut ranks apart, but they refused to move. On the left flank, the Hartack Regiment rushed forward to support the flank of the 27th Pennsylvania. However, they had trouble finding the rebels in the smoke, not helped as the rebels were in the lower ground. The regiment moved back, fearing that they would go too far and they would run into the rebels into the smoke and fell back. However, their commander ordered them to advance again and open fire on anything that moved in the smoke to their front. Two rebel regiments directed their fire on the 134, slamming volley after volley into their men. The situation inside the brickyard was hellish. Inside of it was a place of death, screaming and blood. Wounded men cried pathetically as they were dragged with bloody trails to the rear. Rebel miniballs clattered against a solid fence or thudded into corpses. Colored riders were shot in rapid succession, but the stoic defense still held with the desperation of a forlorn hope. Coster continued to hoarsely shout rallying cries to his men as balls crackled all around him. 
He saw the rebel flanking force was taking heavy fire when a runner from the heart attack regiment warned him of a new threat. More of those bastards! The 154th will withdraw to the fence! Corporal Ernest, go to the commander and tell him another brigade is on the far left! The men of the Hardtack Regiment looked to their left in horror as another rebel brigade advanced from across the Harrisburg Road. Their officer quickly ordered them back to the brigade by the 1st Ohio Light Battery. A wounded man sat up painfully, his coat stained red and pleaded, No! No! Don't leave me! Come back! But the regiment had no time and continued to scramble back to the fence line as many bulls cracked all around them. In their haste to get over the fence, many men tripped, causing them to stumble, causing the regiment to take a lot longer to traverse the obstacle, all the while the rebel regiment drew closer. As they withdrew, the 3rd and 4th guns of the 1st Ohio Light Battery roared, lobbing shells into the rebels, firing on the hardtack regiment pieces. On the right side of the brickyard, men loaded and fired as fast as they could. Screaming and moaning wounded were pulled out of the line into the- Coster looked to the left flank, worried as he had no fresh troops to counter this new threat. He then turned to the 134th, who were in a position that was exposed to infrared fire on both flanks, and ordered them to take a position by the yard. The regiment briefly stopped as the officer declared defiantly, Boys, let's stay- said sharply. If you do not want to be surrounded and overwhelmed, you will take your regiment to support the battery. That is an order! The officer then saluted reluctantly, and the regiment rushed to the left flank. In the brickyard, the men's mouths were dry from biting into cartridges, arms sore from ramming, and shoulders bruised by the heavy wooden and brass-plated stalks. In the center of the brickyard, the 134 followed its starry banner through the unbearable heat of smoke and flames. To their right and rear, the men could hear the screaming and moaning of the dying and wounded as they were pulled from their lines, and it seemed as if the regiment had marched off the mortal plane into the fire and brimstone of hell itself. Right wheels! Their commander ordered, pointing his sword, stained in powder smoke, snapping some of his men out of it as the large regiment snaked towards the Harrisburg Road. The devil's cries from the horde of advancing rebels could be heard through the sulfur smoke as the 134 formed into line. The men saw a rebel brigade to their front with battle flags every few yards. The rebel commander shouting and pointing towards them. To their right, the Hartek regiment moved down the fence line, their men ducking through the choking smoke as rifles cracked and bullets whip flashed about them, clattering against the fence. One man swore as he thought he was hit, only to look down to see that his canteen had been slashed open by a bullet. The hail of ball and bullets tore the uniforms of the men, which felt like people pulling on their arms. The men brought their rifles up to their grimy, sweat streaked faces to fire, not having to aim into the grey and butternut horde, closing in like enormous jaws. On the left flank, the rebel brigade formed as a line, replacing the wary men of the original rebel flanking force, unleashing a fresh and more accurate hail of musketry on the stubborn defenders of the brickyard. At the same time, the brass napoleons of the 1st Ohio Light Battery roared, loving shells over the rebel horde, bursting in black cluttered smoke, raining red hot shards of metal. In the meantime, the Hartack Regiment continued down the fence toward the barn riddled with holes from mini and musket balls, through the choking, blinding smoke that hissed with bullets. The men never imagined being under such a rain of bullets. From beyond the fiery cloud bank came a booming call, the charge, then the obscene rebel yell as a rebel regiment split off from the two brigades and rushed down the Harrisburg Road. Then through the cloud a rebel regiment could be seen, their men brandishing bayonets and their eyes flashing with maniacal delight. The rebels smiled savagely as they charged, firing as they advanced through the thick powder smoke swirling around of them as the rebel yells rose like panther screams. The nearby gunners of the Ohio Battery swung their guns to bear, and flame and smoke erupted from their barrels as the cannon opened a bloody gap in the rebel formation. Load double canister! Hitch up the guns and prepare to limber and haul off! Let's give those bastards another taste of it before we get out of here! Through the smoke, the devilish screams of the Greybacks grew louder and louder as the rebels rushed the first Ohio light battery obscured by the clotted smoke from one of the guns. Then the rebels were upon the battery, their leftmost company overwhelming one of the guns. The gunners made a futile attempt to fight them off until the rebel regiment formed a firing line and the company withdrew. Another cannon boomed, sending out more canister balls screaming through the rebel ranks, hitting men in the rear of the ranks, bloodying their tunics and tearing off limbs. The rebel regiment then wheeled left and fired down the line of the battery, and the fire was too much for the three guns, and the three of them limbered up and hauled out. 
However, some of the guns that finally held their ground as lead whistled around them. A wounded man with blood matting his hair directed his gun, leaning on the wheel of a nearby caisson. Inside of the brickyard, despite holding the enemy in check and executing well, the inside of the brickyard was filled with the blaze, blood, and danger. As sergeants and corporals attempted to fill the gaps in their units, but they came faster than they could be filled. As the rebel fire continued to crackle, the battery lost cohesion, and the battery commanders rushed to rally the remaining pieces as bullets and balls cracked around them. Within the brickyard, hammers fell on percussion caps and rifles hammered into the shoulders of the men holding the grey tide at bay. The men's tunic were blackened by powder and stained in blood. That same blood soaked into the ground of the brickyard. On the right flank, rebel musketry continued to tear into the batteries, throwing them into disarray. Heckman took charge of the two guns by the Kuhn property, threatening to rake the rebels with envelope canister fire. On the right flank, the drum roll of musketry on the artillery batteries had a terrible effect, pushing all the guns to their front back despite the nearby commanders. When disaster struck, as the 134th New York broke and ran, for God's sake, sir, we need to get out of here! We are being horribly cut to pieces, and the cannon will have abandoned us! Damn it! Bugler! Sound the retreat! <laughs> the officer of the 134th made a futile attempt to rally his regiment as they rushed from the brickyard. Coster looked to the fleeing 134th and swore to the smoking flame that surrounded the brickyard. He sent a runner to the hardtack regiment to withdraw to the far side of the pasture. The men fired one more volley in the dry heat and the bugle was sounded. Coster moved to the center of the brickyard by a thin bullet scar tree to reform the line, every nerve in his body telling him to go back to rush through the town and back up the hill to join the rest of the corps. He looked to the hardtack regiment who despite being horribly cut to pieces still held the wolf-colored demons at bay, and so he took courage as his men would hold. The officer of the hardtack regiment organized his men. As Coster trotted past the 27th Pennsylvania, he ordered them to cover the right flank of the hardtack regiment as he began to restrict his line. Coster briefly rode to the hardtack regiment and shouted a few words of encouragement. He told them that they were doing well and that he was proud of them for holding the great tide at bay. Then Coster rode to the center of the brickyard, determined to continue their stubborn resistance until unable to fight any longer. Coster then ordered the Pennsylvania Legion down the fence line as he continued to restrict his lines to fill in the gap. The rebels in response cried out the fierce no of the rebel yell followed by a blast of musketry. On the left flank, one of the rebel regiments crossed the Harrisburg Road and rushed towards Heckman's two cannon by the Kuhn property. While the rifles of the Hardtack regiment opened a galling fire on them, their men dirty faced and their uniforms torn. However, the rebels did not set upon the battery with their savage blades but passed the battery, then the Kuhn house, then down Stratton Street. The rebels charged with the blistering cloud of lead, dirty faced with their torn uniforms, eyes wide and staring ahead, all the while screeching their hateful rebel yell. The large rebel regiment forced Heckman and the hardtacks to make way in their wake as terror flowed like ice down their veins as some of the rebels passed almost an arm length away. Coster looked around to see that the rebels were on all sides of the brickyard and trotted towards Stevens' run. Soon afterwards, sagging his shoulders at risk of being surrounded, he ordered a general retreat across the run. The bugles of the regiments blared and their sergeants echoed the command. Get out of here, you damn fools! The rebels are closing in on all sides! The damn Dutchman will do anything to get glory after Chancellorsville. You get out of here, don't worry about us, we'll hold them. Or none of us will get out of this damn brickyard. Coster was the first across the run, his mount splashing across the stream, a rebel regiment not far behind him as he moved down Stratton Street. At the same time, the Hardtack Regiment and the 134th New York continued their withdrawal through the center of the brickyard as the rebels on Stratton Street wheeled left, threatening to sweep down the brickyard into the disorganized brigade. At the same time, the Pennsylvania Legion held the right flank, resting their rifles on the fence of the brickyard as they fired obliquely at a large rebel regiment moving down Stevens' run. The Hartack Regiment's officer ordered his men to stick Holloman across the run. As his men obeyed, eventually vaulting over the fence and splashing across the run, as the men followed their colors, they were whipped back with rifle shot and men were plucked back by mini balls as they rushed around the brickworks. As a large rebel regiment advanced, the Pennsylvania Legion saw they could do no more and the legionaries formed column and withdrew. But the rebels were too close and the retreat lost cohesion and turned into a rout as the rebels unleashed shot and savage glees and jeer. As the two regiments arrived on the other side of the run, the men of the hardtack regiment, who had suffered crossing the water now red with blood and filled with bodies, saw the 134th New York. They glared with disdain towards the regiment, whose retreat was the reason why they had to leave the relative safety of the brickyard. However, they had little time to focus on this as Coster gave orders for the brigade to take up another defensive position by Stratton Street. 
The Hardtack Regiment formed a line, bringing their guns to their shoulders and firing on the rebels in the brickyard as the 27th Pennsylvania formed a line on their right. The Legion in the meantime retreated through the gap. The 134th finally advanced to form a line left of the 27th. Boys, let's stay here! Let's make sure the last of the Corps can make it to the hill! And make sure those rebs pay for every inch! The men in the new lines must were dry from biting into cartridges, arms sore from ramming, and shoulders bruised from the heavy wooden and brass plated rifle butts. The Pennsylvania Legion rallied by Cosser, who yelled above the racket of rifle fire, Thank you, Ben, for holding the flank. We must show these rebels we aren't whipped yet. Seeing the 134th beginning to lose cohesion in the typhoon of rifle fire, Coster followed the Legionnaires to try to ride the New Yorkers, as fat trickles of wounded men struggled from the confusion to the town. Coster then galloped ahead, the commander of the 134th New York soon rallied the regiment under his watchful eyes. Then, looking to his left, he saw the men of the 27th, after taking heavy fire into their left flank, began to take steps back as they reloaded. Coster helped to steady them as the Pennsylvania Legion's column arrived behind the 134th and the regiment formed a line, a few stragglers rushing to join them. When the Legion arrived in position, Coster ordered the New Yorkers to the right flank. The men were relieved to be out of danger, and their officer didn't think they could hold much longer. As the regiment repositioned, they didn't form a column, and as they rushed to the flank, they took devastating fire, keeping the men's heads low. They were covered by the ragged fire of the 27th Pennsylvania, and the Legion advanced to support their right flank. Coster looked down the line at the men as they brought their rifles to their grimy, sweat-streaked faces and gave another volley. He saw that the 27th Pennsylvania were taking heavy fire to their front and flank. Men staggered, spun, wretched, and fell as bodies heaped on bodies, blood soaking into the ground. Coster then ordered them back. The 27th officer, thinking they were ordered to the rear, moved quickly, but they were quickly halted by Coster, who ordered them to move forward, cocking his revolver and firing into the grey and butternut horde. He ordered them to cover their heart attack's flank and fire on the rebels in the brickyard. Boys, the Corps needs us. We must stand a little longer. Then the officer of the hardtack regiment saw something that made his blood run cold, as one of the rebel regiments rushed forward to wade through the bloody water of the run towards them. In response, they emptied wax paper cartridges into their blackened rifle muzzle, then their ranks crackled with rifle fire. Many of the rebels were plucked back and soon joined the many floating bodies in the red water. This sudden rebel advance soon forced the hardtack regiment back, knowing that their numbers were better suited to an exchange of lead than a confused melee. But once again, the rebels flanked wide, using their bayonets and brass rifle butts to smash down a fence of a property that covered Coster's brigade's length. Another rebel regiment moved to splash across the run. The Pennsylvania Legion wheeled left to fire on them. They were stunned by this accurate fire and moved farther down the run, allowing the 27th and hard tanks to adjust their fire on it. Coster ordered the Pennsylvania Legion toward the cover of the fence. The Legion's officer countermanded the order and they quickly rushed back. However, before they could about face, a hail of musketry crackling all around them caused them to lose cohesion. Coster managed to rally the Pennsylvanians, then they were ordered to about face as the rebel regiment swung farther around their left flank, hidden by the fence. The men put caps on their cones, leveling their powder blackened barrels, unleashing flame and smoke into the horde, while another rebel regiment emerged from the bloody banks of the run into the withering fire the two combat shrunken regiments. The 27th Pennsylvania suffered in the whistling fury of balls from the rebels taking shelter in the red banks of Stevens Run. Coster managed to rally them as the Hartack regiment fired obliquely down the run into the flank of the rebels, forcing the rebels to go to ground. At the same time, a small rebel regiment threw itself forward. Then the 27th were ordered back and they quickly formed into column and doubled to the rear. Coster then rode to rally the men of the right flank as the 27th was ordered back in order to shorten the line as the rebels closed in from all sides. As they moved to the rear, rifle fire crackled all around them from the rebels in the run, causing them to duck and shiver helplessly. Then they began to retreat. The Pennsylvania Legion was also ordered back as well. As they withdrew, the 27 Pennsylvanians rallied on their line. Costa then ordered the men of the 27 to the scarred wooden property that acted as a hint to the line. Then the 27th, on their way to the battle scarred house, lost cohesion in the withering rebel fire, and soon after, so did the Legion. The two regiments holding their flanks then began to fall back as the brigade center collapsed. Kosterman sagged his shoulders and made up his mind. He held as long as he could, and it was now time to fall back. It's time to go. You have done your duty and can do no more. Withdraw to the hill. Look after yourselves. God bless you. 
Coster attempted a piecemeal retreat of his brigade towards the city. He ordered the 27th Pennsylvania back towards the brick house that was not spared the ravages of the battle. Then the heart attack regiment was ordered farther down Stratton Street. Coster then turned in his saddle to see if I, the 27th took heavy casualties and lost cohesion again. Then suddenly the legion shattered and ran as many balls cut through the air around them. The officer roared at the fugitives to hold their ground but they ignored his raving. Kosher rode in front of the 134th to rally them, powder blackened the faces of the men who looked forward towards the horde of rebels. Kosher ordered the 27th and the 134th back towards the track. The 27th then lost cohesion and he then the 134th broke and ran. The 27th once again lost cohesion and Kosher urged them to withdraw to the town. He turned to give the same order to the Hartak regiment, then the 27th ran away. Coster then reluctantly sounded the retreat and the remnants of the brigade rushed into the town. Although he held as long as he could, Coster felt a shame of retreating and betraying the townsfolk who cheered the 11th Corps' arrival. Many of his men were ushered into their home to escape capture from the savage grey clad horde until they could rejoin their army. I'll never get used to that. I hope I get back to the American battlefield. I never want to go in a detour like this again. And the little time I spend in that machine, the better. Artillery fire? That's too heavy for the American battlefield. Where the hell am I? Christ, here they come. Better get rid of that confound machine. Come on, come on. They're here! Come on, men, keep your eyes open. I don't want the Bosher to give us a surprise. I don't like this. We are too exposed. I wish we would have some spiders to support us. You will need others to support you in a minute if you don't pipe down. Anyways, so the reports tell us to save as much coal as we can. Did you see that flash? It could be another German secret weapon. Take your squadron and look around. What? This one's a civilian. I thought they fled this sector a long time ago. I wonder if he still has anything good on him. Or maybe he's the one who set off that secret weapon. Thinking. A few more steps and he'll be on top of me. I can't zap him. There are too many of them and they're too well armed. I don't have a drop on them either. Come on, you bastards! The boss are attacking! Let's return the favor! Christ, that was close. You have to recall an infernal machine to get the hell out of here. I fancy my chances more on that primitive battlefield than here with modern weapons. There it goes again! Move it! Open fire! Damn it, those bastards won't leave me alone. I hope I won't need to do more repairs when I get back. 